Detroit Muscle. It's a brand new build with a late model Mopar that we're going to give away to one of you guys. The idea? We're taking down a Hellcat. If you haven't figured it out yet, this is our next project vehicle. It's a 2010 Challenger SRT8. Now it comes with the 425 horsepower, 6.1 liter Hemi V8. But pushing better than a 4,000 pound car down the road. Now out of the pony cars offered by the big three, this is the largest and the heaviest which has always posed a challenge for the engineers at Chrysler. Now, with that being said, this car is roomier and a little more comfortable, especially if you're bigger than this guy over here. Now, despite its girth, this thing is no slouch. It'll do zero to 60 in 5.1 seconds. But compared to the top of the mountain, when it comes to late model challengers, this thing is light years behind. In 2015, Dodge dropped a bomb on the modern muscle car landscape. It scorched the earth with the introduction of the Hellcat Challenger. Injecting a huge amount of enthusiasm into the entire Challenger lineup, the 5,000 first-year Challenger Hellcat units produced sold out almost immediately. And along with its sister, the Charger Hellcat, it changed the face of modern muscle. Okay, so if we're going to get serious with our SRT8 here, the first thing we're going to have to do is compare it to, well, the Hellcat. Now this thing is armed to the teeth, touted as the most powerful muscle car ever produced by anyone. That 707 horsepower could be planted to the ground via either an eight-speed automatic or a six-speed manual. Everything is bound down by a set of six-piston Brembos with 15.4-inch rotors behind 20 by nine and a half inch wheels. The interior is just as much luxury as it is muscle, and the engine is able to make all of that power thanks to a supercharger making 11 pounds of boost, fed via these inlet ports masquerading as headlights. A set of diffusers on the hood keep things cool by moving hot air out of the way. When Dodge dropped this bomb, the world sat up and paid attention. It's an overlap of muscle car and supercar, with all the ingredients it takes to make for an apex predator. So that's what we're up against. If we're planning to beat this thing, we're going to have to make at least 707 horsepower at the crankshaft, and then we're going to have to put that power to the ground. Not only that, we've got to ratchet up the handling and stopping capabilities of this thing to a whole new level. At the end of the day, we got our work cut out for us. We're partnering with PowerStop to create this monster, the PowerStop Ultimate Challenger, which we've nicknamed the Stray Cat. And you know what we're gonna do when she's all done? We're gonna give this bad boy away to one of you guys. We're aiming to beat a Hellcat with it, but if you aim to take it home, head on over to PowerStop.com. Good news is, we don't have to do all the work ourselves. You might be noticing that we got something missing. This old car wasn't sitting in the building no time, and them old boys down there in engine power done snatched out that old Hemi. They're gonna take the stock block and heads and use it as a base for a 426 cubic inch twin turbo stroker. The power output they're gonna generate with this build is going to eclipse even what a Hellcat makes. Well, for now, we can't say much more than that, but there's no doubt about it, we're gunning pretty hard for those Hellcats. And while they're busy putting that engine together, we're gonna work on the rest of the stuff like the suspension and brakes. The first thing that we're gonna address on our Challenger is the front suspension. So we went to Summit Racing and got a full eye box setup. It's got a 35 millimeter sway bar and some pretty trick coilovers. They allow you to lower the car up to 2.3 inches. And it also has a 46 millimeter piston and you can adjust the rebound and compression by simply turning that knob. Now, the first thing we're going to do before we raise the car up is we're going to take these nuts off here that hold the upper strut mount to the body. Ah! Ah! 
we gotta get these factory calipers out of the way. And to remove the rotors, you can cut this little retainer. Now a screw jack can be placed under the lower ball joint to keep pressure on the spring. Then we'll hit the shock bolts with some WD-40 Specialist Rust Release Penetrant Spray. Then we'll run off the nut that holds the spindle to the upper control arm, let some pressure off the screw jack, then smack it a few times to free it up. Now we can get that strut pulled out. The process to install that new shock and spring setup is simply the reverse of the removal process. Before we button up that front end completely, let's get that sway bar swapped out. We're upgrading from a 30 millimeter bar to a 35 millimeter one which is gonna help us out in the cornering department. This one will be more rigid and help that front end do what it's supposed to do. With the sway bar taken care of, we can get back to finishing the coilover install, including a set of new sway bar links from rockauto.com. Finally, we can tighten down the top shock mount bolts and the front end is ready to go. Coming up, find out how we plan to make that Dodge handle piles of power. All right guys, we're ready to get started on the back half of our Mopar. Now this thing's got the independent rear suspension like a lot of the newer muscle cars out there. And these things work really great if you're carving out the corners, but they're not that great if you got sticky tires, big power, and you're trying to launch this thing and go straight pretty quick. But there are a few options out there to fix them up. The first upgrade that people often do is swap out their half shafts. These are from G-Force Performance and they've got billet one piece stubs upgraded internals, and the metal itself is made out of an aerospace steel that's substantially stronger as opposed to the OEMs. But depending on your power level, this upgrade may not be enough because the next weakest link is the center section, but there's a cure for that. This is G-Force Performance Engineering's 9-inch IRS conversion kit, and it's a pretty serious setup. It's built to withstand up to 2,000 horsepower, but it's still a bolt-in kit. You just simply put this unit into the housing and you're pretty much ready to go under the car without any cutting or grinding. The axle shafts that come in the kit are similar to what we mentioned earlier, but they have 35 spline inner stubs. Now it's time for us to get back to work so we can get all these goodies back under the car. The first step to getting this rear end swapped out is to prepare the cradle to be dropped out of the car. Now that involves unbolting the rear shock. Then we'll lower the car down and set the whole assembly on a heavy duty rolling cart. We'll use this toolbox that we have from Matco. A few body bolts are all it takes to free up the subframe from the car. Then we can raise it up to split them apart. Watch your springs, they'll lose tension as the rear end unattaches. Hey, go on up. Well, we've got our rear end assembly out of our Challenger and on this cart out here in the open where it's easier for us to work on and easier for you to see. Now, the core of our rear end is the center section here, but we can't just unbolt it on its own. We've got to get some other stuff out of the way first, like the axle shafts and the spindle. First thing we're going to do is strip the spindle down. We'll get this trailing arm detached from the spindle first and swing it out of the way. Then we'll work on getting the calipers off. When you take off the rotors, be sure to account for the balance of the unit on your cart. Ah! 
Now you can move on to the sway bar length. We'll go ahead and pull off the sway bar itself as well. Next, we'll get these upper arms detached from the spindle. Then, the lower control arm. We also need to undo this wheel speed sensor. We'll hit the hub with some more WD-40 rust release spray, then go to town on it. A pry bar works well to get the half shafts pulled out. Then we'll roll the cradle back to access this rear diff bolt. Couple more on the back, and the center section is freed up for us. Stick around. Up next, we make our challenger stop on a dime. Hey, welcome back. While you were gone, we went ahead and got our cradle all cleaned up and some new bushings installed in our control arms. Now these bushings came with our suspension kit that we got from Summit Racing and depending what angle you install them, that determines how much positive or negative camber is built in. We also got the rear end all assembled. Now this jewel is ready to go in. That looks heavy. Mm, not for you. Our new center section kit came with some urethane bushing upgrades, so we'll install those with the mounting bolts. We're also using blue thread locker on all of these bolts to keep them at home. These half shafts bolt onto the splined inputs using bolts provided in the kit. The last thing that we pretty much have to install is the sway bar that we got from Summit Racing. Now this is an Eibach piece as well, and this is pretty much the reason why we had to drop the K-member out. It's because it sits on the top and you can't snake it through. After we get it tight, all this can go up under the car, finally. We'll lower the body most of the way onto it, leaving room for the new springs that we got from Summit Racing. These come with an adjustable perch, which lets you lower the car should you wish. We put ours at the lowest setting to make installation easy. We'll set the ride height later. We can also install the performance shocks from Summit. Now we can lower the body the rest of the way down and get those body bolts run in. Okay, now that we've got our suspension all buttoned up, it's time to start looking at the brakes that we're gonna be using on our Challenger. This is Chris, he's with Power Stop, and like we said earlier, we're partnering with them on this build. Now Chris, let's start out by talking about the brakes we're gonna be using on our SRT8. Well Mark, this is the Power Stop Street and Track Brake System. Let's start with these rotors. These are the Power Stop drilled and slotted Evolution rotors. The drill holes help to keep brake temperatures down and the slots help to keep the braking surface clean. They're also zinc dichromate plated to keep them free of corrosion and rust from the elements. Well, you said this kit's for the street and track. How does that work with the pads? Well, these are our track day pads. They're a carbon fiber ceramic formula that's made for maximum braking on the track. They're also resistant to fade up to 1200 degrees. To extend the life of your track day pads, we also include our Z26 Street Warrior pads for quiet, dust-free braking for everyday driving. Both sets of pads come with all the necessary hardware and assembly lube. We've also included our red powder coated calipers with this kit. So as you know, we're going after the Hellcat with this. So what makes a brake kit like this able to keep up with something like that? 
Well, the key is really in the track day brake pads. They were designed on the track for maximum coefficient of friction to allow us to compete with the larger brakes that come from the factory on the Hellcat. Well, it looks like we're in really good shape as far as the brakes go on our Challenger. And we should be able to beat even a Hellcat in an apples to apples stopping test. No need to dilly dally, let's get these things on the car. While Chris and Mark are getting those brakes plugged in, let me tell you about one of the advantages of this kit. This power stop upgrade does something a lot of the upgrades don't do, which is preserve the brake bias on your car. OE manufacturers put a ton into development, and an important part of that is front to back braking bias. When you start to mess with that by introducing larger components, particularly if it's just on the front, you can decrease your braking ability by changing the balance. This power stop kit eliminates that issue. Well, Chris, that looks really nice. Thanks a lot. And hopefully you can come out when we get this thing on track. Yeah, absolutely. It was my pleasure and uh, we'll see you out there. Hey guys, the next thing that we want to do on our Challenger project is a little bit of measuring so that we can determine what the offset for our wheels are going to have to be. Now we're planning to upgrade the size just a bit as opposed to what this thing had on it when it rolled into the door. Now sometimes whenever you're doing that kind of measuring to determine your backspacing and offset, it can get a little bit tricky, but we've got a tool we want to show you. What we have is the wheel fit. It allows you to accurately and easily measure for backspacing and offset. Whenever you order your kit, they have optional plates that have different lug patterns depending on what you're working on. The first thing you want to do here is adjust the clamp to fit the bead of the tire like so. Run this screw down to hold it in place. Do this on all four clamps. Then take the center section of the tool and set it for the width of the wheel you're looking for. In our case, that's 10 inches. We've attached one half of the clamps to the center section and with it locked onto the bead, we can slide the other half in place. And now we can put the whole thing on our hub and get to measuring once we've got it centered onto the lugs. Loosening this adjustment knob allows you to slide the tire in and out. We're hitting the inner wheel housing now, so that's too far in. Let's pull it back out. With five and a half inches of backspacing, looks like it's gonna give us the perfect amount of clearance between the side of the tire and the side of the car. Now, it's the fun time, picking the wheels. We've all been there. You're working on something and you break the head off of a bolt, and wind up with it stuck in whatever you're working on. Well, let me show you this cool little tool from Summit Racing. This is called the Bustin' Out Broken Bolt Removal System. It uses a three-step process where you attach these to a high-speed die grinder and prep the broken bolt surface to allow you to drill it out without harming the threads in the hole. This flattens the surface, this bevels it, and this routes it out to accept an extractor. Now this set is for a half-inch bolt, but they're available in a bunch of other sizes too. Whether it's old car parts or neglected tools, we all have rusty items laying around the shop. Now that stuff's not a lost cause because you can remove the rust with Metal Rescue. It's a water-based rust remover that's non-toxic, non-hazardous, and biodegradable. It's not an acid, so it's super safe yet extremely effective. Just soak your rusty stuff in the solution, rinse, and dry. Then after the rust has been removed, give it a quick spray down with dry coat rust preventative to keep it from returning. Check out how well it worked on this old toolbox. You can see that half of it's been cleaned up and it stayed rust free. That's all the time we got for now. Y'all keep it between the ditches.